Till 12 days before Christmas, but uh, this early, I wanted to share you with the excitement that the so-called wise men, the Magi, eh, felt when they heard about the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is important because year after year, generation after generation, some people celebrate Christmas for the wrong reason. And we've got to be reminded from the Bible, from the wise men who probably were more than three on why we celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Today in this little story that I want to share with you, um, we'll see how wise men from the East celebrated the birth of Jesus. And we are going to look at the story from the perspective of these wise men who traveled a great distance to seek after the child. Well, Bible scholars say they, they traveled with, with a huge entourage, for they were rich, they were influential, they were powerful. And probably that's the reason why Herod didn't lift a finger to have them executed when they inquired about the king of the Jews who was born in Bethlehem. They were influential men. Now, the question is, why did they travel a great distance? What did they want to do with Jesus Christ? The Bible tells us very simply in Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, that they have come to worship Jesus. So this group of VIPs came to worship Jesus. Now, the word worship there is very interesting in the Bible. It means, it means to kiss. To kiss, as in kiss the ground when bowing down before a superior. That's what worship really means, to kiss. These wise men were seeking Jesus to pay homage, to worship this child who is barely two years old, born to a very poor parent. So, why would they do that? The same question should be asked today. Why does the people, uh, why does the whole world pause and celebrate Christmas? And why would you come and why would your friends and family ask you to come? So, what's so special about Jesus that we should celebrate his birth? I know you've heard stories about the birth of Jesus Christ. Well, these wise men knew more about Jesus than, than many of us do. They, they recognized that he was not just another king, but the king of the Jews. You see, God has promised the people of Israel that he would send the ultimate savior, the ultimate king. Now, Israel was a nation that was sinful and damaged and ruined by sin, and there was never a king who can lead them to true righteousness, peace, and joy. Yet, here in the scriptures, in the Bible, repeatedly, God promises Israel, promises his people, I will send the king, my servant, my chosen one, to save you. And the most intriguing part of this story According to scriptures, in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 6, and Isaiah 43, 10, this king, this servant, this chosen one prophesied in the Old Testament is none other than Yahweh himself in the flesh, according to Jeremiah and Isaiah. The Lord God Yahweh says in Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord. If you look at your Bible, it's in all caps. The Lord is in all caps. It means Yahweh in the Hebrew text. When I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live securely. 
and this is his name by which he will be called. This is the name of the servant. This is the name of, of the chosen one, according to Yahweh himself in Jeremiah chapter 23. And what's his name? The Lord Yahweh, our righteousness. The Lord Yahweh, our righteousness. That's the name of the servant. That's the name of the righteous branch. The name of the king that will save Israel is Yahweh, our righteousness. Now, in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10, God says, You are my witnesses. That's the Lord God, declares Yahweh. And my servant, whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he, meaning the servant, meaning the chosen one. Yahweh is declaring himself as the servant and the chosen one. Before me there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. And so Jesus said in Luke 24, 44, all of the prophets, meaning including Moses and Isaiah and Jeremiah, and also the psalmists wrote about me. How can that be possible? It was never mentioned in the Old Testament, especially in the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah. The only God who created the universe alone, according to scriptures. The only God who created the universe alone, for God was with no one in the beginning, according to Yahweh himself. In Isaiah 44, 24, he took the form of a servant so that he can pay for our sins on the cross and experience that and experience that experience that why god wants to experience that why it is because according to scriptures that through his death he destroyed the one who has the power of death that is the devil and free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives Yahweh, God the Father, had to be manifested in the flesh like us, but without sin. Without sin. To experience what we normally experience as a mortal man, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God and aid those who are tempted just like us. For many people, this is hard to understand. How can God manifest in the flesh? How can he be born in the flesh and yet sinless from death till his death on the cross? How is that possible? So, the others invented the story. For Jesus to be born without sin, his mother should be sinless too. And this belief became a church dogma for centuries. Dear brethren, in relation to John chapter 1 verse 13, if you have your Bibles, in relation to John chapter 1 verse 13, the reasons why Jesus was born sinless, unlike you and me and all the other humans, are these things. All right? Number one. Jesus was not born of blood, meaning he was not born of natural conception or through the union of the sperm cell and the egg cell. That's reason number one. The power of the Most High overshadowed the Virgin Mary, and she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Number two reason. Jesus, unlike you and me, was not born of the will of the flesh, meaning the birth of Jesus was not the result of the union between a man and a woman. Christ was born not because of physical impulse, but by the will of God. Number three reason. Unlike you and me, Jesus was not born of the will of man, meaning that of a natural father, a mortal father, but by the will of our 
Almighty God. Three reasons why he was sinless, though he was born of a sinless woman, Mother Mary. If a person is born not of the blood, not of the will of the flesh, and not of the will of man, in short, born without the involvement of the fallen man whatsoever, then indeed, he is sinless. Jesus is sinless. And that is the case with Jesus Christ, the perfect Lamb whom Yahweh made to be seen, according to scriptures, though he knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. No wonder Isaiah called Jesus wonderful and mighty God in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called, what? Wonderful Counselor. What else? Mighty God. And listen to this. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Yahweh, the God of the Father in the Old Testament, is Jesus Christ in the flesh in the New Testament. That is why Paul revealed in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19, that God was in Christ. God was in Christ. Now, all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their wrongdoings against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now, most probably these magi were like the prophet Daniel, who was also one of them. Daniel was also a magi, the chief of the magi during his time. Look, uh, like Daniel, I believe, they had read the scriptures pertaining to the coming king, the servant, the righteous branch, the chosen one, and I will give you proof that somehow, with God's intervention, they understood what is written in the Hebrew text. Let me read to you Matthew chapter 2, verse 11 again. And it says, And after they came into the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What is the significance of these gifts? What do these gifts symbolize? But before we answer that, let me ask you, if, if you knew that the family just had a baby and you go to visit the family, you want to bring some gifts, what would you bring? Well, for us, we thought of giving a cake-like diaper to Viola and Alex three weeks ago. I mean, it's practical, right? It's useful. A baby needs it. And we also thought of giving them formula milk, but we didn't know if they want to feed their baby with instant milk, so we scratched the plan. But the wise men, the wise men did not bring any baby stuff, but instead, they brought three important gifts befitting a ruler, a savior, the chosen one. So what are these gifts? These gifts represent their understanding of who they worship. These gifts prove that they know Jesus is king and God. Look, the first one, the gift of gold, is a gift given to a king. Jesus is not just the king of the Jews, but the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords, according to Revelation chapter 19, verse 16. And that is reaffirming the text in the Torah in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17. The second one is a little bit strange. Frankincense, which is used to make what? Incense. I think people of all cultures understand that incense is offered to 
deities. Deities. The giving of frankincense was proof that the wise men understood that this child is no ordinary child, but God, the very God himself, in the flesh. And the third gift they brought was a natural gum or resin called mir. Mir is an ingredient in the holy anointing oil used to anoint the tabernacle, what else? High priests and kings. It is also used, by the way, to embalm dead people, to embalm the dead. When someone dies, the body rots, corrupts, smells very quickly, and they use mirror to retard that process. So these magi, rich, powerful, and influential men who seem to have everything in life, traveled a great distance, hundreds of miles, just to present these important gifts to baby Jesus. Do you know why? Of course, they knew he was the king and God. Well, aside from knowing that Jesus is the king of the Jews, they had other reason for traveling a great distance to seek the young Messiah. Let me give you a hint and help me fill in the blanks, all right? I've got four blank sentences. And the answer to fill in the blank is a seven-letter word in English. All right? Seven-letter word in English. Here goes. Number one, the rich man needs blank. The poor man has. If you eat blank, you will die. And if you die, you will bring blank with you. I heard a couple answered, answered the uh, question. It's N-O-T-H-I-N-G. Nothing. Nothing. The wise men, though they probably had all the material things in the world, had nothing in themselves to save their souls from death and the fires of hell. They needed a savior, savior and when the good news about the birth of a ruler reached them, they immediately sought after him. They traveled a great distance to see him and to give praise and worship to the child. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Well, a rich man needs nothing. He is set for life. That's what we all think. That's how you think, maybe, maybe even today. The Hollywood actor Robin Williams was a very wealthy and famous man, and yet he suffered from depression and anxiety, later on committed suicide. In Japan, one of the richest countries in the world, more people died from suicide last month, last October, than, than, than from COVID-19 in all of 2020. While the reasons for Japan's high suicide rate are complex, long working hours, school pressure, social isolation, and the cultural stigma around the mental health issues have all been cited as contributing factors. This only proves that all of us are broken. All of us. All people have a missing piece no matter what their standing is in the social strata. And that missing piece is God, our Savior. One can have all the money in the world. He can, he can even buy lots of cars and houses and use the money to get all kinds of relationships and titles, but his money cannot fill up what is empty inside of him. It's only the Lord, it's only Jesus Christ who can fill that void and cleanse man from the addiction of the material things in the world. 
God is the only one who can change the heart of men from the heart of stone to a heart of flesh and the emptiness inside. He fills it with His Holy Spirit so that man can walk in God's statutes, be satisfied, and joyfully follow His ordinances. The wise men, they had money, they had power, they had influence, yet they traveled hundreds of miles because they knew, they knew only this ruler can save them from their sins and bring them to the Creator God. The Bible is not that complicated, my dear friends, my dear brethren. It is about God and how we sinful men can be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, who is both 100% man and 100% God. And we know that sin leads men to death. But Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me and shall never hunger, and whoever comes to me shall never thirst. Clearly, there is a lasting satisfaction when we are reconnected to God through Jesus Christ. Jesus also said, I am the light of the world, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not understand it. Many people lived in darkness. They are confused, bewildered, and no matter how patient you are in sharing the gospel to them, they will not be able to understand it. Listen, if you go to the streets and, and preach the gospel, most probably they will not be able to understand it unless, unless they repent, unless they, they, they change their mind, and unless they accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Ordinary people cannot understand who and what the light is without the Holy Spirit enabling them. Without the Holy Spirit. And look, in the Bible, in the Scriptures, in the book of Luke, the apostles, they've been with Jesus Christ for how many years? For more than three years. And yet, and yet, they did not understand that the Messiah had to suffer on the cross and enter him into his glory. Only when Jesus opened their mind in Luke chapter 24, verse 45, that they understood the prophecy in the Old Testament about the Son of Man. Paul, in his letter to the Christians in Corinth, mentioned this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 to 14. And this is very important for us, for our understanding. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 to 14, saying, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God. Why? that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart these in words not taught by human wisdom. See? And we impart these in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. See? Believers will be able to grasp the light. They will be able to understand spiritual truths because they have the Holy, the Holy Spirit enabling them, empowering them. But for the unbelievers, they will fall short of the understanding, the truth, the good news of salvation. And the reason why is in verse 14. This is the answer. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. They are spiritually separated. If a person rejects the things of the Spirit of God, meaning if he rejects the Word of God, if he will not accept that he needs a Savior, he will fall short of the understanding of the gospel, of the hope of redemption, because he is spiritually separated from God. The Apostle John said, In Jesus was life, and the life was the light of mankind. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not understand it. Believe it or not, many cower in being converted, in being a Christian, because they believe that if you become a Christian, 
There will be lots of restrictions and life will be full of struggles. But Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he dies yet, he lives. All Christians struggle in one way or another. That is true. But though we struggle in the end, but though we struggle in the end, we will come out victorious. For Jesus said, in the world you have tribulations, you have trials, but take heart, I have conquered the world. This is probably the reason why the wise men, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. The Bible does not say they rejoiced. They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Clearly, this was an expression of their unbelievable joy that money and power could never buy. Dear brethren, Christmas is all about the love of God. Period. We should never add anything to it. There is nothing we can add to God's goodness. It's never ab about us getting gifts or giving something to others. The essence of celebrating Christmas is remembering God's love. And if we truly believe that the VIP of Christmas is Jesus Christ, then we should make every effort in making Him happy because it's His birthday. It's not our birthday. I know of two things that can make God happy according to the Scriptures. And just to wrap this up, these are the important gifts that we can give Him and it will not cost us a dime. Number one, recognize God. Accept Him, acknowledge Him in all our ways. And if we know God, if we acknowledge Him, then we are bound to love one another. That's why the Apostle John says in 1 John 4, 7 to 8, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love God does not know God because God is love. How do we love others? Simple. It's how we would like others to treat us. And number two, obedience, keeping His commandments. God said in John 14, 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. The two important gifts that we can all give God after saving us from eternal destruction because of our sins are recognition and obedience. So to those who are here watching on television or YouTube, will you today humble yourself, acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and receive eternal life that only God can give? I hope you will. Let us pray. Our everlasting Father, our mighty God, we praise you and thank you for your precious word. You have given us the light and the understanding of your great hope of redemption. May you now give us the privilege, the strength, and the boldness to proclaim this great news to others so that they too will rejoice exceedingly with great joy, knowing that we all have a wonderful Savior. All glory and praises to you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With the sound of strange symbols and heart, we praise you. We praise you. With the timbrel and dance and shouts to you. Worshipful call.